This is Ethan, and I'm here with Dave, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 72-inch. On this week's episode, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Another One Rides the Bus and interview Dr. Demento cast member Beefalo Bill Burke, who was on hand for that historic recording. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al it's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast. You don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast. This is a very special episode for us. Not only is it our six foot episode, it is also episode 27 inch backwards. Yes. And 72 is the temperature in Albuquerque. Well, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast, it is. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else is special about 72 inch? 72 inch is my height. Wow. And you're taller than me, so we must have missed my height. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're reporting the news that all of our listeners want to hear about. My height and your height. <laughs> and the temperature in Albuquerque. <laughs> well, now we've set a precedent, Dave. We have to report the temperature in Albuquerque each week. <laughs> but first, let's chat a little bit about the reaction from last week's episode, 71 Inch. Now, of course, we interviewed two awesome creators of documentaries we had justin martell and vince clementi on yeah their documentaries tiny tim king for a day and the palindromists or the palindromists <laughs> always got to say it both ways you never know one of our <laughs> palindromist friends are going to be listening that's and... right just in case <laughs> now during our interview with justin i talked about how i wanted to buy tom green's record that justin's record company ship to store put out and dave i actually did buy it and i received it and it's really awesome so when I say stuff during interviews, I'm not just buttering up our guests. <laughs> I really bought it. And sometimes you actually physically butter up our guests. So that's really nice when that happens as well, too. <laughs> yes. More to look forward in year two is me <laughs> literally buttering people. <laughs> You know, last week's episode inspired me to actually write a palindrome. The first ever palindrome that I've ever written, I wrote last week. I put it over in our group, group.2000inch.com, the official group of Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast. And not only that, but the official Instagram account for the Palindromist movie, they published it on their Instagram account. So now that it's published, I can't use it in the next palindrome competition. The suspense is killing me and all of our listeners, Dave. What is the palindrome you wrote? All right, so I knew I had to work both my name and your name into the palindrome. And I tried to work our intern's Frank name into the palindrome, but his name is hard to say backwards. Knarf. It just wasn't working. So I did get you and me in the palindrome. And here it is. Evade noon? Nah. Tell Ethan. No one, Dave. I love it. Now, <laughs> Dave, can you read it backwards for us? Evade noon? Nah. Tell Ethan. No one, Dave. Ah, nice. See, it works both ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time to check the 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, which is sponsored by Angel Valenzuela and David Cash, two amazing Weird Al fans and podcast supporters. All right, let's check out the first message. Hey, Dave and Ethan, it is your old pal Spencer Parks. I just listened to your uh, most recent episode, number 71, Inch 71, uh, where you talked about two documentaries. I specifically wanted to talk about palindromes because uh, I have always loved palindromes. And, you know, I think the same part of the brain is used because I also love backwards talking, where you phonetically reverse some, the way something is said, and then you record it and you play it backwards, and then it sounds relatively normal. Uh, they use this in Twin Peaks, if you're familiar with that. Anyway, my friend and I once, figured out, actually, it wasn't me at all, it was all him, I have to give him all the credit, he figured out two phonetic palindromes. So the first one is, Rob ate a nutty bar. Now, it won't come out perfect, but I think you get the idea. And then the other one is slightly uh, explicit, but so feel free to not play this one if you don't want to. It's uh, I just wanted to let you guys know about those. I love palindromes. I am going to watch the palindromid 
Pendromanist? No, that's not how you say it. I'm going to go watch that documentary this week. I'm very excited, and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye. Wow, thank you, Spencer. It's so great to hear from our friend and host of the Dictionary Podcast. I was really amazed. I had no idea that there were such things as phonetic palindromes. Me neither. Well, Frank, why don't you reverse that first one for us? Rob, eat a nutty bar. Rob, eat a nutty bar. And since Spencer says that second was explicit, let's save that as a project for our listeners to do themselves. Last week, we asked our listeners to call in if they had any birthdays that matched up with a significant event in Weird Al history. You guys listened, and here's one right now. Hi, Dave and Ethan. This is Eric Rhodes again. Uh, I just heard the call for significant Al uh, milestones that happened on your birthday. Uh, my birthday is October 23rd, 1978, which, if I'm doing my math correctly, I think was Al's 19th birthday. And it was also the birthday of Johnny Carson, Sam Raimi, Walt Flanagan from Comic Book Men, and Ryan Reynolds. But the important thing is Al. Thanks for the call, Eric. Hmm, Al's birthday, born on Al's 19th birthday. I don't know. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch. I'm not sure if that one actually counts, but we do appreciate the attempt, Eric. Speaking of special dates, do you know what is so significant about this past Monday, September 14th? Yes, of course. That's such an important day for Weird Al history. On September 14th, Burrito Burrito continued their Monday tradition of doing their special vegan burger pop-up wizard burger. No, that is not what I meant. This week's episode is brought to you in part by vegan Mexican restaurant Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York. Home of the two-pound double wrapped in a quesadilla Burrito Burrito. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito. Find them at burritosquared.com and at Burrito Squared on Instagram. And remember, not every burrito is a burrito. Burrito, 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 but every burrito, burrito, burrito can be burrito, burritoed. Well, there was something else from September 14th that I was going to talk about before you brought up burrito, burrito. Oh, speaking of burrito, burrito, do you know burrito, burrito has limited edition glow in the dark t shirts available for pre order? Just head over to burritosquared.com to pre order yours while supplies last. Monday, September 14th was the 40th anniversary of Weird Al's recording of Another One Rides the Bus live on the Dr. Demento show. That's what I was going to say. I think our listeners know the significance of that date, but it was also the first time that Al met John Schwartz, who banged on his accordion case for that song as well. Yes, and we now know him, of course, as John Bermuda Schwartz, who has been Al's drummer ever since. That's pretty impressive, staying in one job for 40 years. <laughs> I'm just glad he upgraded to drums. You know, the accordion case can only do so much. <laughs> Could you imagine if all the drums in Al's songs were replaced by accordion cases? I would love to hear special editions of his songs with all the drums replaced with accordion case. If you're listening, Bermuda, you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a little bit more in our interview later talking about Another One Rides the Bus on that special day. But our friends Luke Ski, TV's Kyle, and Linzilla, they helped celebrate the 40th anniversary of Another One Rides the Bus by covering it at FumFest 2020. Yes, Luke Ski was on vocals tv's kyle played the accordion and of course Lindzilla, she banged on the accordion case their song is available to listen now at the fump.com but it will be released on the upcoming fump fest 2020 compilation so you do want to check that out when it does come out as well yes and speaking of friends we also have six awesome new friends we met these six great friends over at ShakeWell.com. S-H-A-K-E-W-E-L-L-E dot C-O-M. Whoa, check them out. Do our new ShakeWell.com friends have names? Of course they do. There's Steven. There's Lucille. Deirdre. Ebenezer. Botto. And Dale. I love all of our new friends. You know, of course, Steven, you know, he's got those awesome cowboy boots and like a sandwich. And he's wearing this really weird outfit that reminds me of what Axe and Smash used to wear in Demolition. Cool. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know what's great about these friends? Not only do they have awesome personalities and outfits, you can visit them anytime. They're way better than real friends. Yeah, where else can you find a friend that's just a torso and a head that's floating through space? Nowhere else but ShakeWell.com. That's S-H-A-K-E-W-E-L-L-E dot C-O-M. Until next week, my friends, I'll miss you. Now, speaking of friends and the 40th anniversary of Another One Rides the Bus, 
We have a great interview lined up this week. Let's get to it. We are so excited to welcome to the podcast someone who spent a decade answering phones on the Dr. Demento Show, and he contributed to Weird Al's career-altering recording of Another One Rides the Bus. Welcome to the program, Beefalo Bill Burke. Hey, Beefalo. Hey, Dave and Ethan. How are you? <laughs> We're great. Thanks for joining us. How fun. Uh, thanks for the warm introduction. <laughs> There's so much that we have to talk to you about. Dr. Demento stuff, Weird Al stuff. You're very entwined with Al's early career, and I, I feel like we just need to start from the beginning. So when did you become a fan of novelty music? Well, it uh, started in high school. Um, I was at a uh, high school in Tustin, California, and a friend of mine mentioned there's this weird radio show I should listen to. Uh, it's called Dr. Demento. And I, I didn't even think about it or do anything. Um, but my family moved that year. And then I um, went to San Pedro High, 1973. And um, I just uh, started listening to the Dr. Demento show with my friends in high school. I was in the print shop. And uh, me and my print shop buddies would, would just joke and sing and and talk about the the top 10 at the time and uh whose songs made it and what was great and you know all the all the monty python jokes all the uh <laughs> der Fuhrer's face all uh, there were so many times we heard uh groucho Marx singing hooray for captain spaulding i can't believe how many times that made the top 10 but uh <laughs> you know yeah, petitions and things like that uh but in high school, I wrote a lot of letters to Dr. Demento, and uh, he'd read them on the air. I'd write poems, and he'd <laughs> read those on the air. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was quite a, a thrill to be uh, to be a part of that uh, that scene. And were you beefalo at that point, or when did that come into play? No, no. At, you know, I really what happened is uh, I went off to college. Uh, Graduated from high school, and uh, Dr. Demento dropped me a line and said, "Hey, um, you know, you're you're going off to Cal Poly. There's somebody else who's going off to Cal Poly. You you guys should uh, meet up sometime." And he gave Al the same spiel. <laughs> and one year, you know, you know, the first year in the dorm, uh, Al posted a note on my door saying, "Hi, Dr. D said I should." come and meet you so hi and uh, <laughs> kept that note it's part of my souvenirs it's fading but it's uh it was the first uh time i got to meet al was wow. there in the dorms <laughs> wow <laughs> did you guys start college the same year yeah yeah um i was in the red brick dorms that first year i was in a, a quiet dorm a tanaya hall and al was in the uh the concrete architecture style dorms mm. We had the dining hall in between us, and um, I don't didn't do a lot of things with Al that year, but you know we did recognize each other and say hi and stuff like that. Oh, that's great! Oh, so you weren't in any classes together with Al or, or anything like that? No, 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 nothing like that. It, you know, the first year we pretty much did our own thing. I had a friend who built me a little radio station for my dorm room, and uh, me and my roommates uh would play records and and stuff like that uh one of my roommates big bob he one day he put on uh jethro tull and the mu album lifted the arm on the record player and, and went away for the weekend <laughs> and so <laughs> to this day I, I cannot listen to bungle in the jungle <laughs> and i and i swear i swear i had to have told al that story because, you know, the, the line in that song uh, uh, makes your iPod only play Jethro Tull. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, Came from it. the dorm days. Every 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 bit of his songs has a little gem of truth in it. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, of course, virus alert, I think you're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, I'll hear a song and I say, Dang, he's telling our inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so while you were in college with Al, did you get to see any of his, you know, coffee house shows with Joel Miller or anything to that effect? Oh God. You know, I was such a terrible friend. He'd invited <laughs> oh, no. me to him all the time. 
<laughs> it, it, I worked on the newspaper, so I was printing the newspaper on the nights he was in the coffee house. Mm -hmm. And so I'd miss his shows. I, it really um, is one of my great regrets in life because I knew about him. I knew Al. We were friends. And I didn't go to his show, support his shows. I didn't even write in any. I, I've looked through my memor, you know, my memorabilia from high school, from college, and, and there's nothing. I never even wrote it down. Oh man! Oh wow! Did you write about the upcoming events or anything in the newspaper? Um, well, I wasn't in the editorial staff. I was actually the printer. Oh, okay. But I, I got real excited that uh, that time Al came home, you know, with the uh, the My Bologna song because mm. he he came out with that and um made the newspaper front page the picture of him it looks like he's slurping out of the latrine with a with his accordion <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah that uh I've never gone to his coffee houses I, I regret that i was too busy in the newspaper but we did do radio shows oh yeah yeah he you know he had his the weird owl show for a long time and his was a really popular show uh, everyone loved it I don't have any tapes of it but um, I tried to do a Beefalo Bill show and that uh, yeah, it kind of was okay I, I mean I'm sure I did fine <laughs> <laughs> I've got one or two air checks I just mostly strung songs back to back uh, I did like a, a show of, of birds and so I play bluebird back to back with uh you know every song i could think of about birds <laughs> but i but i'd hardly talk i'd just string the songs back to back and, and then at the top of the hour i'd announce hey it's kcpr san luis obispo right <laughs> and so was beefalo bill is that your dj name is that how that came to be that goes back to um when i started answering the phones for Dr. Demetto. I was over at his uh, house just yakking up in the living room and, and you know, he was saying, ah, you got to have a name. You got to have some kind of a name. And, <laughs> uh, Buffalo Bill's taken and you can't do Bungalow Bill because the Beatles did that. And we both sort of jinxed each other and said, hey, Beefalo Bill. Yeah, that, that'll work. <laughs> and it stuck. So how did we go from fan of dr demento to hanging out in his house what was the path there i know he was reading your letters on the air but when did you actually you know start meeting him in person and, and going into the station uh it probably started when i brought a petition in for my friend little leon's good time kitty band a song called the garage sale <laughs> so me and my buddies drove up to the station at kmet and delivered the petition in person and it was you know several thousand names so the the petition had to get the song on number one but dr Tomeno had this rule that he had to play a song before it could be number one <laughs> and besides that day he didn't bring the record anyway or the the reels are real mm -hmm. he didn't bring it anyway so he didn't have it and so my friends and i went home with, you know, dejected. He didn't get anything out of the trip. But the next week, <laughs> but the next week he, he played the song. It was number one. And it, it even made the, the top 50 for the year, I think it was. Wow. It was way down there, like 50 or 48 or something. It, uh, but it did make the top. <laughs> it made it in. So it got played at least uh, three times, I think. <laughs> and that, that's the song called The Garage Sale. And how did that lead to you then, you know, becoming pretty much a cast member and you know, answering phones and being there for pretty much a decade? Yeah, it just sort of happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by that time, you know, we knew each other pretty well because I'd written so many letters and he'd written them back. And mm -hmm. uh, there was also a trip he took to uh, Magic Mountain and live show there. And I met him. I was in the audience there uh, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> the show was four hours. Uh, Roto Ritter came on before, and um, and then uh, during the show, uh, Jungle Judy uh, ran out to the audience to grab people to sing Shaving Cream, and I I must have looked uh, desperate or something. She <laughs> waved my hand, so she she picked me and brought me up on stage. I I got to sing Shaving Cream. <laughs> nice, oh, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it was a blast. Uh, I still listen to that show with uh, 
it brings tears to my eyes because it's such a fun show. But um, yeah, it just sort of morphed and, and I ended up being on the show. And, um, you know, during the mostly during the sophomore and junior and senior years is when we would take trips from Cal Poly down to L.A. Um, and then, uh, you know, Al would go see his folks. I'd go see my dad and um, we'd meet up on the way back and uh, carpool back to Cal Poly. So I, I can't oh, say cool. how many times I carpooled with Al, maybe half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. But um, that was a part of our, our college years. Drive to drive to L.A., spend a weekend, and then finish off Sunday night, stopping off, doing the show, and then driving back and, and trying to get back to class on Monday morning. <laughs> now, my geography of California is not that that thick, but how about long of a drive is that? It's a good four-hour drive. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, it's nothing too bad to do four hours for a weekend. You can get um, from San Luis Obispo, you could get either to L.A. or to San Francisco. Oh, you know, uh, yeah. you could get to Fresno too if you wanted to. Uh, I'd do that to go up to the mountains. So for California, there's um, you got Los Angeles area, the San Francisco area, San Luis Obispo is right in the middle. You can get either way from San Luis Obispo. You could go north and get home in four hours, or you could go south and get home in four hours, depending on where you came from. So there's you know a melting pot of people at San Luis Obispo at Cal Poly who you know, half the people come from Northern California and half the people come from Southern California. There's sort of a click going on. The West Side Story. Kind of. <laughs> now, I live in Northern California now. I kind of regret not making more Northern California friends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so curious about the Dr. Demento stuff. So it just, it sounds like you just kind of like, like we said, morphed your way onto the show. And then, you know, what exactly was a normal run of show like for you? Well, you'd um, basically you'd look forward to it all weekend, and you'd <laughs> drive to the station. Uh, Doctor D had given us a, a business card with our name on it that uh, we'd present to the gate, and we'd pull into the parking lot and wait for for Barry to drive up with his little um, uh, what's that car with the the Wankel engine Mazda, little brown Mazda, <laughs> and he'd you know we'd help him carry the boxes of records and tapes up to the station get in the elevator go upstairs the dj from before is up there uh quite often it was like cynthia fox and she's playing green grass and high tides forever they just put the needle on and walked out so we've got the station to ourselves for 20 minutes <laughs> and, and we just were you know settle into our routine right at the beginning of the show uh, everybody gathers in the studio, gets a microphone ready, and grabs a toy a noisemaker <laughs> from the box of noisemakers. Uh, everyone had their favorites. You know, Sulu had the Mew Cow. Uh, uh, there were the ratchet spinners and things like that. I, I, I quite often had the siren. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we'd all yell, the doctor is in, and <laughs> all the noise we could make and wind up your radio and the Dr. Demento show, and he'd announce all of our names, and, and then he'd start the show, and, and we'd go off to the phone rooms. And, you know, we'd sit in the phone rooms, and, and the phones would be blinking off the hook. They're the old-fashioned <laughs> uh, push buttons. Right. It'd be, please hold, KMT, please hold, <laughs> KMT, please hold. <laughs> And uh, we'd have four or five people online at, at, at any one time. Sometimes we'd break off into groups to work more efficiently. Sometimes we'd uh, work uh, as one big mass of, of <laughs> jokesters. <laughs> and um, yeah, we had a checklist in front of us, and we'd just put tallies in front. Most of the songs that are on the show were on the checklist, so we'd just check them off and... Uh, someone would request something that's not on the list and, and you'd have to write it down. <laughs> and and those are fun, you know. Um, sometimes people would ask to talk to the doctor himself and, and I thought that was that was a really cool thing. I, I really liked it when when Doctor D would pick up a phone and talk to a fan and, you know, he would glow. It was just <laughs> an amazing moment to see, you know, and it talking to his fans and you know a lot of times I, I really was a fan of the show more than 
anything else. So a lot of times I'd bail on the work and I'd just go listen in the studio to the tunes. <laughs> 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 and I'd talk with I'd talk with Dr. D and and you know, sometimes I'd make him late to cue, but not that often. <laughs> Once in a while, I'd slip and say, uh, hey, Barry. And oops, because he would scowl. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, don't call him by his real name. Wow. <laughs> but it wasn't as bad. It wasn't as bad as, say, Wolfman Jack. He told me a story one time. He saw Wolfman Jack at a at a dinner function. He said, hi, Bob. And, and Wolfman Jack looks at him and says, it's Wolfman. It's Wolfman. Don't ever call me Bob. <laughs> Wow, that's great. <laughs> and would you only answer to Beefalo if someone didn't? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I, I, I have no preference. And, no. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a photographer. And so I would often um, wrangle my head around what I should put on my photographs. Do I, do I sign my name Beefalo Bill? Do I sign my name Bill Burke? You know, <laughs> how do I want to be known in the art world? <laughs> And uh, someone somewhere said, you should use your real name. So I, I use my real name. And I'm not well known as a photographer. Of course, on the Internet, I'm, I'm world expert on developing film and testing. And I could tell you anything about film photography. And, and on the Internet, you sound, you know, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but in real life, no, I, I haven't. Uh, I've only sold a few pictures in my life. Some of the pictures are from the early days. Uh, do you remember there was a, a show on MTV? I think it was called Behind the Music with Weird Al. Yeah. Yes, of course. Dr. Demento put in a good word for me. They called me up, and Sherry Marf Cooney from MTV signed the paperwork, and, and they they paid me $75 a picture. Wow. Oh, wow. They used, they used so five or six pictures uh some of them they weren't counting right but i let them use them anyway i <laughs> didn't argue after that point you know I, yeah. they paid me we had a contract <laughs> and, uh, i'd just taken a business photography class uh, uh not a class but like a workshop okay and so this that was you know much later it wasn't during the the, the 80s when when that happened but um but I used my talent from the workshop to negotiate a fair price for my pictures. I was proud of that. And, of course, it was the world's most famous uh, Behind the Music episode ever, thanks to <laughs> oh, my <for> pictures. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the Behind the Music episode with Al, but what were some of the pictures of yours that were in the episode? Well, there's uh, pictures of uh, Another One Rides the Bus. I took three pretty decent shots of our getting ready to do the show. And so um, Bermuda shared one of these pictures the, the other day, and I got like 500 likes on it. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Oh, wow. I never had that much attention on one picture in my life, except for a, a, I'm also a member of dog spotting. And one time I took a picture of a, of a cute girl with a, a little mini chow and uh, got 500 likes for that. <laughs> So either cute girl with a dog or weird owl. You gotta <laughs> one or the other. And 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 I'm a nature photographer. I want people to look at my pictures of rocks and rivers and streams and trees. <laughs> Make sure Al is in those pictures or a cute girl with a cute dog. <laughs> you know? And I do have some pictures of Al with uh, nature in the background. Oh wow! Because because the weekend of another one rides the bus, everybody came up to my cabin. Yes, we have to talk about this because that is such a legendary weekend. It sounds like bring us through the whole weekend. Well, the place where my family had a cabin is called Holy Jim Canyon. Uh, you might have heard about the Holy Fire that ravaged uh, Southern California a couple of years back. Well, that was really Tribuco Canyon. The the guys on the mountain didn't recognize the canyon that they were looking at. You know, they, they saw a fire coming up from over the ridge and they thought that was Holy Jim, but really from the top of the mountain looking down, you are looking at Holy Jim. So they named the fire wrong. Our cabin was down in the that first niche. It didn't burn down. I don't own it anymore, but um, but our cabin didn't burn in that fire. And that canyon didn't burn in that fire, but the one next to it just got gutted. That's just to give you the setting. 
it was um, one of those Forest Service inholdings. Uh, back in the 20s, the Forest Service let people build vacation homes in the mountains, and uh, they had a lease that you can you know, just pay them a little bit every year, and you get to have the property. Uh, you're leasing the land. You d don't own the land at all, um, but you own the physical structure that is on it. So we own the cabin, but not the ground. And uh, we own that from like 1964 till um, 1989. And um, it was going to be my cabin. I, I love that place. I'd go up there on occasional weekends once I learned how to drive. And I'd bring friends and I'd uh, spend the weekend. And, and this was one of those weekends. Uh, we had Barry. We had... Uh, Lori O'Grady, Ludacris Lori. Uh, her, her name's Lori McMillan now. Let's see, who else was on that trip? I uh, should look at the pictures and get, get a good um, read on it because my car only holds five people, so it, it had to be uh, <laughs> Dr. D, Damascus, Lori, me, and Al. And Al. <laughs> oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> I, knew we were sending, I knew we were leaving somebody out. <laughs> And we, you know, we just do what you do when you go to a cabin. You uh, kick the rats out. You clean out the flu because they put the rat's nest in there. If you light the fire with the the rat's nest, it'll smoke you out. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah. You put together lunches and dinners and um, go on hikes and wander around. There's a there's a creek that runs up and down. There's a waterfall people hike to. I don't think on that trip we hiked to the waterfall. We hiked downstream. It was a great weekend, and yeah, everyone knows the story that Al was writing his his song there. <laughs> There's no radio. You, you had no way to get the radio. And we knew the song had to be um, Queen's Another One Bites the Dust, but nobody had a cassette of it. Uh, nobody had... We couldn't get reception, so had to do it from, from memory. Wow. So he told you ahead of time that this was going to be a, a parody of Another One Bites the Dust? Yeah. Yeah, we knew that. We knew that as we were going along. And um, he was like, yeah, you know, you know, bump, bump, bump. You could do that, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was panicking. I, uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, there's no way. I'm not a musician. I don't know the song. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but... You know, I was happy that my friends were at the cabin and we were playing in the water and I was taking pictures. I got a lot of pictures of that day. And um, we all come back and go to the radio show. And everybody knows the story about, uh, you know, we, we were, did a little practicing <laughs> and uh, uh, everyone knows John came in to the station the same very day, the very same day. Yeah. And he, he very politely introduced himself to me and said, I'm a professional drummer. And I said, well, here. <laughs> and I handed him the accordion case. So that was going to be your job. And you pawned it off on him. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. And, and, you know, in that one moment, all history changed because uh, if it had gone the other way, if I had been like, no, I'm going to do it. And, uh, you know, and, and he, he, John, as polite as he was, you know, he would have said, OK, OK. And, and I would have ruined it for everyone. I wouldn't have kept the beat. I wouldn't have, you know, the song would have been trash. It would have been heard one week and out the next. And, and everything would have gone downhill from there. <laughs> Dave and I would be interviewing Yanni fans at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I want to hear every single detail about Another One Rides the Bus. So I know you're saying, yeah, everyone knows the story, but... Just tell us stuff, even if we've heard it before, because this is it's such a fateful day in Weird Al history, as, as you're saying. Yeah. And, and Barry likes to tell the story about how he got the tape recorder going. And he did, it, you know, reel to reel, spinning on the background. He, he made sure that the levels were good. He made sure that the microphones were all positioned right. The, the sound was checked. Everybody got uh, into position. Um, everybody had a part to do. Everybody... Um, so at the at the station, a couple of people came in. Mike Kiefer comes in every week, and he brought Tom and Jerry to the show. So so they were there as well. 
And um, so we all got in position. Sulu was there. And um, God, what other details are there? So we got the tape <laughs> rolling, um, come in, start start banging away. My My job was you know miscellaneous noise and i had the siren and i was going i was going to cue the drum solo and so i i said okay i'm going to blow the siren and you play the drum until i blow the siren again so when you hear the two sirens you'll know it was it was me who cued john in and out and i i don't know music i have no idea how long i held that (laughs) <laughs> I just I just let John play forever. <laughs> and and uh, I think the only other time you hear me is is when the page turns because I flipped the paper and it was pretty close to the microphone and you can hear the page turn. <laughs> and you know Mike Mike Kiefer did the the hand noises that was uh, his signature sound. Of course. Sulu also um tries to do hand noises she doesn't do it as well but she was in there um <laughs> it's fun to hear mike Kiefer talk about sulu you know after a fashion sulu could do the noise as well <laughs> and sulu <laughs> was making the noises uh, the ending of every song of uh, a barnes and barnes song ends with yeah and um both Sulu and damascus threw that in at the end of another one rides the bus mm. just uh those those were thrown in. I don't think they were quite at the end, but they're they're thrown in there. <laughs> and um, you know the, the burping noises and other noises that uh, sometimes it's Sulu, sometimes it's Damascus with the deep voice, and I can't tell which one's which. <laughs> <laughs> and what were Tom and Jerry doing? Uh, they were making noise as well, noise makers. I, yeah. I <laughs> didn't catch what they were doing. Maybe they were being shy. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, the the regulars, Sulu and Damascus, Art and Artie Barnes. Um, you know, I knew all these guys really well because we were on rotation. You know, we'd come in and out every other week. So mm-hmm. I, I, I can remember what all my friends were doing. Yeah. But uh, occasional people would come in and... and I've got pictures of them, and I kind of remember them, but I don't remember everything that they did. Obviously, you know, we all know the version that was recorded and, and put out on the air and on eventually made it onto the Placebo EP. That wasn't the first time. I mean, you had mentioned you had done some um, rehearsals out in the hallway. I, I've heard different accounts of it. I don't think we did the whole song ever before. Hmm. Oh, okay. I think it was a, a hodgepodge of try this, try that. Al did the whole performance. I mean, the, the performance of the song was purely him. Yeah. And I don't believe we did any performance of it before. Wow. Uh, hmm. Little bits in that, sound check, level check, you know, maybe uh, a little noise here and there, but no actual performance until the, the tape was rolling and we were doing it live. Did you at least get to see the lyrics or anything beforehand, or was that the first time you heard some of it. Yeah, no, um, Al was writing the lyrics under the tree. I had a hammock set up, and uh, he was stretched out in it, and um, I, I'd seen the pages. I I knew, I kind of knew what the words were going to be. Mm-hmm. I didn't memorize it, but I knew, I'd seen the lyric sheet, and, and yes, and I was in charge of flipping the sheet during the <laughs> actual performance, so I saw it then. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Al... Al used to occasionally collaborate with us when he was putting together a song. Oh, yeah? Did he ask for your input on, on this song at all? I somewhat, yes. I, th- I think it may be a nod to something that, that bothered me at the time and that I wanted to write a song about the Who because of the, the famous uh, the slamming in the door uh, crowds and, and the, the tragedy at the Who concert. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to write a song. And it was going to be a uh, really morose, uh, serious song. It was not going to be comedy at all. Yeah. It was uh, going to be called People Are Dying to See the Who, <laughs> Struggling in Line to Get the Best View. <laughs> and and Al was telling me, yeah, Bill, you got to do that. You got to do it. It'd be the greatest. And, uh, and I got a hunch that that's why that line's in the song. That's funny. Wow. Wow. <laughs> 
So I'm actually still curious about this weekend at the camp. So tell me about, you know, you know, doc, Dr. Demento is with you guys. Does he get the best bed? You know, like, like, <laughs> <laughs> I would have to hope, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I'll draw the scene for you. So Tribuco Canyon uh, is up a seven mile dirt road from um, Cota de Casa, you know, where the housewives of Orange County live. <laughs> <laughs> so you take this left turn and go up a canyon. You basically drive up the riverbed. Uh, it's a dirt road. It's not very well maintained. In the spring, it's awful. But midsummer and late, you know, early fall, people have gone up and down the road enough that the bumps are out of it. The the major pits and you know the the road's pretty passable at that point. And um, I drive an Austin Marina up that road. That was my car at the time. And I'm I'm pretty good at it. My mom taught me how to do this, you know. Uh, she drives Cadillacs up the road. <laughs> and I've got pictures of this. What's so funny is that, you know, the, the time my mom drove her Cadillac up the road. And, and there's times when we have to get out of the car so she can go over the river. Because otherwise she'd scrape bottom. So we all get out of the car, walk across the creek, and then get back in after she's got to the other side. And we... we go driving past and there's a guy with a four-wheel drive jeep stuck in a mud puddle <laughs> and we're driving by thumbing our noses at him oh. <laughs> so then you you turn left at a fork in the road there's a one creek goes up holy jim to the left and the main creek goes straight up tribuco and um and then there's this you know up against the hills are these little series of rustic cabins and they're all made by hand you know the the foundation may have a little concrete here and there uh, a lot of rock and cement and um yeah the up to about waist height is just boulders and and it's just a beautiful way to build a, a wall and and then you know the two by fours and the framing and everything to make the rest of the cabin Mm -hmm. And they had to be painted either brown or green. You could use white trim. Ours had a dormitory upstairs. Okay. Like 20 foot by 20 foot room. Just one big room. And all the beds were up there. Got it. And so um, now I think, I'm not sure who got the best bed that night. <laughs> <laughs> But I got a picture of, of Dr. T falling because he was clowning around and I, he just slipped between two beds. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's no running water. Oh. <laughs> and there's an outhouse. So oh. <laughs> to, to use the facility, you had to go outside the dormitory door, uh, across the walkway and, and into the outhouse. And um, for water, we'd go walk down to the creek and, and pick up a bucket and bring it to the kitchen and dump it in the sink. And, you know, if you need two trips, you take two trips. <laughs> a lot of oak trees, sycamore trees. Um, there had been some structures in the creek, kind of like um, fish dams that were built in the early days. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers came out the past year or two and blew them all up. Trying to trying to restore the natural surroundings, so they're trying to bring the canyon back to to where a, a salmon could swim upstream if they wanted to. Mm. Some people don't believe it'll ever happen; <laughs> that <laughs> they're wasting their time. I loved the little check dams. I thought they were, you know, a charming part of the canyon. Um, and plus, when you're hiking along and it's hot, you you can you go know, dip your feet in a cool little pool. In the early 60s, they used to stock the creek with uh, trout. So the truck could drop off a tanker full of fish. Wow. <laughs> and my grandfather would go fishing. And uh, Yeah, it was, it was a great little place to have a, have a getaway. That's so fun. And so, so ours was uh, cabin number two in Holy Jim Canyon. The place is still standing, although it's hard to recognize it. Uh, some hippies had taken over and turned it into a little bit of what it's not. 
but mm. it's it's still there, still standing. <laughs> and have you been back there at all? Right now, nobody can go back because of the fire. Okay. And so I had on occasion gone back many times, but it kind of breaks my heart because uh, we don't own it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, somewhere along the line, um, I was living in the mountains, and I had a cabin in the mountains, and my mom was telling me, hey, do you still want our cabin? And, and I said, well, you know, I've got a cabin now. I guess I don't need it. And so that's why uh, my mom sold it. Oh, man. Yeah, I should have kept it because now I'm, you know, living in a city and far away from from this place I love. Now, how often did you and Al go up to the cabin together? I think this was the only time Al went. Hmm. Oh. But um, maybe you should have brought him more often so he could have written a few more songs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did go up a couple times with Damascus and, uh, yeah, lots of different friends uh, over the years. But, um, yeah, I should have brought him more. That would have been more fun. <laughs> you should have went to his coffee house shows. <laughs> I should have gone to the coffee house shows. I should have gone to the coffee house shows. That's for sure. One thing I, I was very curious about is on the placebo EP, of course, that we're talking about you're credited with designing the sleeve. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, what aspects it was the entire thing. You was it the photo you I'd love to hear all about that in the process. Well, you know, Al graduated from Cal Poly with a degree in architecture, right? I graduated from Cal Poly with a degree in graphic arts, graphic communications, printing management. And so I had all the mad skills with an exacto knife and uh, photography. And we, tossed around a bunch of ideas and um, LA had just started coming out with those accordion buses and I really really wanted to get a picture of an accordion bus to use as the <laughs> motif but I never could quite catch the bus at the right time so I, that wow. didn't pan out but um, we just did a photo shoot in my living room I hung up a, a sheet over some sticks brought out some lights and we just poked around the li the living room and take taking pictures. Um, <laughs> and from from those pictures, then I I ran down into the basement, developed the film. We pulled them out, looked at them, and and came up with ideas. What should we do? This or that? And somewhere along the line, I got the idea, and Al said yeah to doing a double exposure, where you um you know you you print one picture a little lighter than it needs to be. And then you print uh, another one over top of it at just the right place. And um, mm -hmm. and I just got really lucky in the uh, exposure and the placement of that one picture. Wow. I, I did two. I made two attempts at getting this double exposed print. And uh, the one we use on the cover just perfectly got the iris of his eye right on the pleat of an accordion. Uh, he couldn't have planned it better. <laughs> It's an amazing picture. I mean, it, like, <laughs> was it intentional that the accordion just lined up with like the curvature of his face, or was that intentional? Yeah, it was. In, it was intentional. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't done in camera. It was done in the dark room when printing. Got it. Double exposures done in camera are so amazing. When people do that, um, just blows me away. But this is um, composition printing, and it's you know Jerry Olsman does amazing job of composition printing in uh, his pictures of Yosemite where you have a waterfall coming down and at the bottom of the waterfall you see it turns it into a tree and uh, rocks that look like they have doorways you can walk in and so that was the technique used for that. I did the layout of the typesetting just used rub on letra set letters for that and then Al's handy work on the back he did he laid out all the words he wrote the the text of the back, and he did all that. So my part was the picture, the the black border, the the mechanical work of laying it out. Al did the back with all the the architecture writing, and then we took it down to a printer and uh, got it printed. <laughs> I still think I have the flats. Wow! Oh wow! 
<laughs> That's and amazing. I do have I do have a cut press sheet, mm-hmm. which is pretty awesome. Uh, I do have one of those, and wow. I have a mock-up that I did. Uh, so that's the graphic arts of uh, the placebo EP. I, uh, I didn't put any money into the project myself, but I did get a couple of copies. That's great. The rumor is there were a 1,000 printed. Do you know if there's any accuracy in that number? Um, I, I believe it is accurate. Uh, that's just the way things are done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I never saw more than that. Um, now, when you get something printed and you order a thousand or something, there is a chance that the printer will do five percent more because that's just what printers do. But um, I don't think there's any loose sheets floating around. You don't have a you don't have like a box of thirty of them in your basement or something. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to release right when the time is right. No. <laughs> The one thing I do have spares of is that newspaper when he came out with um, my Bologna. Wow! And um, oh wow! And I sent I had uh, I had three or four of them, and I sent two of them to Bermuda, and I think he kept one and used one as part of the fundraising for the Star. I think it brought in five hundred bucks. Wow! I was I was pretty thrilled with that. Yeah, that that was uh, that was actually the last piece that we listed that uh, from Bermuda's collection, and yeah, I believe it brought in five hundred bucks, and it was a great piece, and I w- really wish I could have bid on it because <laughs> that was one in my collection. <laughs> but I had to keep myself, you know, honest and, and <laughs> you know, not any uh, conflict of interest. But yeah, that was a really nice nice article. Oh so right, cool. yeah. Um, Oh yeah, Kathy Spearnack wrote the article. I don't know if you got to. Yeah, I mean, you have to have pictures of the cover or the text, don't you? Enough to read. You can you can see Mustang Dailies online as well, but they oh, didn't okay. take very good pictures. They didn't yeah, take yeah. very good pictures of them. But Kathy Spearnack was a journalist, a uh, friend of Al's, uh, DJ. You know, other things that we did at Cal Poly were um, the Week of Welcome. I know you've heard of the Week of Welcome Flexi Disc, but of I don't know if you knew that Al was a Week of Welcome counselor. Oh, mm. I don't think I knew that. And that was kind of like a club. You would you would spend uh, you know a night every week for the months leading up to the summer. You would have meetings, and they would teach you games to play and coaching practices. Uh, you know how to how to work with people's anxieties you'd you'd get all kinds of training they'd teach you all about the school because you know we were going to be the representatives of the school and teach kids uh everything there is to know about cal poly and so um we did that uh i was a wow counselor i was a wow counselor kathy spearnack was uh, a number of other people and it's it's kind of weird. You think, okay, now I'm having all this fun in these meetings, and now you know the week is going to come, and we're all going to pal around together this whole week. No, <laughs> they do not let friends be counselors together. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, we each had our own groups, and we each went our own way for that week. <laughs> was that just a club, or was that a paid position? It was just a club. It was yeah. just a thing to do. That's fun. I think I don't. Yeah. We didn't have to pay for it. I think they fed us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Al, of course, did the voice for at least two of them that I'm aware of. Were you on any of those uh, flexi discs as well? No, no, I I didn't get involved in the production of that at all. I wasn't even there for um, my Bologna when it was recorded. Although, I did talk to Al about the song before he recorded it. I was, mm-hmm. you know, I was around. I I don't know where I was that weekend, but. Um, but he recorded it when I was away. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, another missed opportunity. Yeah, he could have been at the recording of My Bologna as well as the recording of Another One Rides the Bus. Uh, it, would have been, it would have been great. But I think more, more than anything, you know, and I don't feel so bad about that. What I feel bad about missing is those coffee houses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how many people can fit in that bathroom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we that bathroom was right across from the radio station, so we all used it. Uh, it was a famous. Not it wasn't famous. It was just the one you had to run to when you had to go. Right. Um, 
<laughs> you know, I did go to one or two of Al's radio shows. Oh, yeah. And um, I had a tape for the longest time of, you know, him ripping a record off and smashing it. Uh, you know, <laughs> take that, Donna Summer, kind of thing. But, um, but I... One day I bundled the tape up and brought it over to Dr. Domeno and said, here, someday you got to play this. And he's lost it. Oh. <laughs> and, and, you know, the world is not that much worse off. You could find <laughs> things just like it. He, I'll use the same clip of the record being scratched several times in this show. <laughs> Now, what do you remember from the Weird Al show as it was on there on the uh, campus radio station? Well, so KCPR had a, a program director who really wanted the station to sound professional. Brian Hackney uh, and Randy Cardoon were so businesslike about the way they ran the station. You had to play so many yellow dots, so many red dots. Uh, red dots are jazz. Yellow dots are... Um, pop songs mm, okay. and you had to fit them in every hour and so my show i tried real hard to conform to the standards and and one time i went insane because uh, i didn't get to pick any funny songs for my show well the thing that al did is he, al got permission to do a show that didn't conform to the program so he could play anything he wanted but not really because his weird al show um one day, um, they were cleaning up the station, and uh, I grabbed a few things as we walked out the door. Al, Al grabbed a white copy of the Police first album, and I grabbed the playlists. So I've got a playlist from 1979. Wow. Oh, wow. So here it is, uh, April 7, 1979, Weird Al, 9 o'clock. He plays Flakes by Frank Zappa. Bear Trees by Fleetwood Mac. Then there's a break. Uh, a Yellow Dot. He had to play a Yellow Dot. Miles Away by Photo Maker. Then he snuck in Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout, Would Not Take the Garbage Out by Shel Silverstein. <laughs> then he had to play a red one. This is a jazz. Down on the Farm by Camel. Then he had to play a current. So he played Living It Up by Bose and James. And then there's a break. Another current one. Precious Love by Bob Welsh. And then he had to play a Yellow Dot. So he played Surrender by Cheap Trick, live at Budokan. And then he played Me by Alan Sherman, Dreamboat Annie by Hart, Men by Martin Mull, Randy's Castle by Spence Burton. This is written down as Slow Grown. That's the first time I've seen that word in this book. So for all you historians, the Slow Grown album came out about 1979, and there's some ambiguity about exactly when it came out and here's here's evidence that it was out on april 7th 1979 interesting well wow. what are you referencing this is a playlist from kcpr the playbook the spiral bound notebook that everybody had to write their songs in so it's just a page torn out of it no i got the whole book <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> So it's Al's handwriting actually writing down these different songs that you're reading us? Yeah, exactly. Very cool. I've got some of my playlists in there, too. And, uh, you know, Bicycle Bob and, and all the other DJs, I have their playlists there, too. <laughs> Very cool. Wow. <laughs> One time I brought that to Cal Poly, and I, I was really nervous walking around campus with it. Because I knew I had, you know, something precious in my backpack. <laughs> if right. something had happened to it, you know, it would be the end of time. <laughs> if I showed it to someone and they said, wow, and snatched it. Right. <laughs> all would be right. lost. Wow. How cool. So the Slow Ground album, I I still don't know exactly when it came out. I know I played Al's song on, from the Slow Ground album on my my show. Um, it may have come out late 78 instead of early 79. Not quite sure when they released it. But um, the story about that album, uh, the radio station KZOZ, uh, commercial rock station in San Luis, put together um, for, um, for a good cause. They put together an album. Uh, they told everyone to send in tapes of your songs about San Luis Obispo. 
And so everybody got excited and started sending in tapes to the radio station. And um, I got involved with my roommate and a uh, girl I was seeing at the time. And we came up with a beautiful song. And uh, it never made it. it. It's called The Keeper of Time. It didn't make the cut. And uh, Al listened to it a couple times. He said, uh, oh, you... you you do the best background vocals, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you are robbed. It should have been on the album. <laughs> Honestly, I think the reason it didn't make the cut was that uh, it was supposed to be a song about San Luis Obispo, and our song had nothing to do with San Luis Obispo. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's like we didn't read the rules. <laughs> Then you did not have any involvement then with the Al's Take Me Down song then because you were working on your own piece, right? Yeah, it, I don't know if it was really a competition between us or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it probably mostly because I wasn't at the coffee house that night, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes back to, you know, all these times I missed the coffee houses. But no, I, I didn't have any involvement in it. And uh, I didn't even talk to him that much about that so i i don't know now living in san luis obispo you know of course al's song is all about the different places in the area were you familiar with all those places as a fellow resident um do you mean those uh fictional places that really don't exist <laughs> the <old> bubblegum <laughs> alley's there the madonna inn has the toilets <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious because every single one of those does. Um, does he talk about the sewers? No. He no. doesn't. I thought that was in the song. Anyway, um, one of the things you do with uh, new students during the week of welcome is you take them on a tour of the sewers. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically there's a creek that runs next to Higuera and it's underground some of the places where the buildings are over it and it opens up into a, a small grotto type park that you can play in. But if you walk backwards up under the building, there's just enough room where you can go in and, and, um, and you can just walk into the sewer. It's, <laughs> it's really just an underground Creek, but, but students would do that. Uh, you'd take your wow group there at night and uh, no one would, it's allowed to have flashlights and you're just walking up kind of a almost dry creek, although usually somebody fell in. <laughs> and um, other places, uh, there's another thing that we used to do. Um, there's a train that goes up the hill around the campus and, and up Quest to Grade, a freight train that runs. And um, basically the the fun fun and games thing to do is 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 called train tunnel tours you would um you'd hear the train coming and you'd rally all your friends and you'd say hey let's go on a train tunnel tour you guys let's go up to the train tunnels and it, people would look at you crazy like and and you'd say no 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 it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun you go up you climb into the cubby hole and you stand back and you watch the train go by it's so amazing you got to do it you got to do it and the, and the fun thing is that because the train is a freight train under load it's got four engines in the front and four engines in the back and it's running at full throttle all you know all the engines are running full full power and yet you can still spend 15 minutes convincing your friends that it's the cool thing to do <laughs> get in your car drive up and beat the train to the top <laughs> and so and so you get up to the top and everyone runs to get into their cubby holes and um and then the train comes by and they see you they honk their horn so now I can't even tell you how many decibels, but you're holding your ears because yeah. otherwise you'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we used to do that. Uh, I, I'd i say I've done that with Al maybe three times. Uh, I'd done it myself with my friends maybe five or six times. Wow. But it was, uh, it, was, it was quite a fun thing to do. 
That's really cool. And then sometimes you'd, you'd drive up Cuesta Grade and hang out and just chill under the on the top of the hill and stare at the stars for a few hours. Oh, yeah. Those are those are the things to do. And uh, one day I took like a day hike with Al, and we just walked that two-mile tunnel from one end to the other. And um, in the middle, we found this rhubarb that had fallen off a truck and started growing. Oh, wow. And <laughs> now I don't know. I don't know. I think one of his songs mentions an albino rhubarb. But that uh, is an homage to that that uh, poor little plant that we found. <laughs> Maybe the rhubarb pie in uh, the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously you were there for the recording of another one, "Rides the Bus." Were you in the studio any other times that Al came in and and did perform songs, and were you involved in any of those songs also? So there aren't very many recordings of me. But one week, a uh, gang came out from Brooklyn and spent a week with Damascus. This was uh, two young women and a man, Alan Reese, he was a DJ, Joy Meltzer, and Alicia Lure. And we spent a week doing all the things around L.A. that you can do. Uh, went to the Troubadour, we went to uh, the place where um, Ollie and Hardy pushed a piano down the stairs. Uh, you know, the, we tried to go to the Hollywood sign, didn't quite do it, went to Farmer's Market, went to a circus. Um, but a couple of recordings came out of that weekend because Damascus had a four-track, and he had a drum machine. And so he's got uh, several recordings that uh, include the whole gang. Uh, this is where It's Still Billy Joel to Me was recorded. Wow. Oh. Um, there's one weird song like, uh, miniature golf yep. and, um, yep. a day in the life of Beverly Hills came out of that. Uh, uh, anyway, there's, there's several songs that came out of Damascus's recording that, that are a lot of fun to listen to. And this was, uh, Damascus had a, he was living with his folks, um, near Fairfax and Wilshire. He had an upstairs bedroom with, uh, shag carpeting and uh it was a hot day we all hung around and and and, uh did a bunch of recording it was it was a great show a great uh a great uh, week um we ended up at um artie barnes's cabin in malibu on the beach (laughs) (laughs) and then everybody went home and went their separate ways (laughs) Uh, that's the uh, that was Damascus and the amino acids. You mentioned Brian Hackney. We actually just had him on the podcast a few weeks ago for an interview. Ah, uh, yes. Um, now Brian Hackney. Um, he he probably doesn't remember me. He may remember <laughs> me. Uh, I have a note where he said someday I'll figure out who you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, he was our program director. Now, um, he talks about, and, and it's, it's common knowledge that, you know, the, the station wanted to be professional and they wanted to have a format. They wanted to have us play, uh, a certain number of popular songs. It was a spot for, uh, a red spot for jazz, uh, yellow spots were for, um, popular music and you had to play I, I can't remember how many yellow dots you had to play in an hour uh, it was it was so um, ornery to have to, to play this format and I was really annoyed by it um, <laughs> and and at one time um, I printed up t-shirts for the whole staff and um, the t-shirts said I like yellow dots and it has uh, just you know, <laughs> kind of polka dot yellow T-shirt. That's awesome. Al has one of those. I don't know if he kept it, but I kept the stencil so I can make a reprint of it any time from the original art. I keep threatening to do that. <laughs> well, if you carry through with that, I'm sure Dave and I would absolutely love to have a yellow I would love dot to have shirt. one of those. Absolutely, a <laughs> yellow so dot cool. shirt. <laughs> Of course, it 
anyone who likes yellow dots, of course, uh, the assumption is that you've lost your mind. Right. You're insane. (laughs) (laughs) Fits us perfectly. (laughs) So, yeah, uh, Brian Hackney, um, I've been really uh, proud of him. He's he's done so well over the years. And, and, you know, every time I see him on TV, I I point at the screen and say, look, there's the guy who fired me. (laughs) (laughs) He fired you? <laughs> There's some, you know, I yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> I say so, but I don't know if he fired me. What what really happened is that uh, aside from just having to play the certain format, you also had to um, do a little community service. You know, record a few spots for the station to use from time to time in their you know station breaks. And um, so, you know, I I think I did one of the required three. <laughs> and so you look at the, you come up to the end of the list, you say, well, you didn't do your job. There you, you don't get a show next semester. Mm. And I think it's as simple as that. Okay. Um, but, you know, the real tragedy, of course, is that the spot I didn't do, I picked it up to do it, I didn't do it, was, uh, you know, to announce that, Michael Nesmith was coming to Cal Poly for a concert. And it would have been really cool to have, you know, built up a whole bunch of hype about him coming to the, st- to the, sh- to the school. Michael Nesmith at the student uh, union. <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, he sold 22 tickets. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Canceled the show. Wow. I never finished the spot. And, and so fault. I always take the blame for that. <laughs> and how crazy that, you know, uh, 10 years later, Al is, you know, touring with, with the monkeys and opening for them. <laughs> oh, that's it, amazing. Oh, yeah. I wonder if he made the connection that, you know, Al's friend is the reason <laughs> his show is not a success. <laughs> it was, yeah, this DJ picked up the spot, never recorded it. They never mentioned that he's coming on any of the. <laughs> It'd be kind of hard to sell tickets. Yeah. There's no publicity <laughs> yeah. at all, even though it's free. Right. <laughs> Uh, the monkeys. I love the monkeys. Yeah, me too. So there's a lost tape out there. One summer, um, I was in summer school. Al was in summer school. We got together at a friend's house, and we we took a tape on, on his real real recorder and um, recorded a version of Zilch. Oh, lost to the ages though. It uh, wow. his his roommate re recorded over the tape. It's gone. Oh no. Oh, no. It wasn't that good. It was not that good. <laughs> <laughs> the world has not lost anything. Well, you know, anything that Al does, if it's lost, is, you know, it's a, a detriment to the world. Was it just a straight cover of the song, or were you guys goofing around? And changing yeah, it? we were just goofing around, and uh, we were trying to do a, a straight cover of it, but it was, um, I, I'm pretty pretty lousy at, uh, at anything. Uh, when it comes to performance, I, I clam up. Oh. I always have, always will. That's just just the way it is. Well, maybe one day we'll get Al's cover of Zilch, and we'll actually get to hear a nice professional recording of that. <laughs> I think that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, but I want I want Beefalo in there too. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, that, that goes without saying. Beefalo's got to come back and be the special guest on that song for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's there's also the time I tried to do Gumby Jaws Lament, and I. Uh, I just I couldn't get out and and just say you know uh, you know as a child we moved around a lot my parents used to set fires in nursery homes and so we had to move around a lot <laughs> I just couldn't come up with the the, the, the banter um, was Al involved in that cover as well that's um, Al actually uh, it's not a cover it's uh, Gumby Jaws Lament is on Barnes and Barnes Vuaha album. Oh, and Al performs. And on Al one, performs correct? the yeah. accordion. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. And so we were just out on the street busking. Uh, Al and Sulu and I were in um, Westwood. We were on the streets of Westwood. Oh wow! In front of a in front of a shop. It was a hot day, and uh, uh, we, we were just chilling. I uh, climbed a tree, and I was going to do the Gumby Jaws Lament. And, <laughs> 
<laughs> couldn't pull it off, but it was it was fun climbing a tree. <laughs> was Al singing songs, or was he just playing accordion? He was playing. Sulu was playing her music. They were singing. Yeah. Um, it was just uh, just the regular songs. I, I can't remember any of the songs other than the Gumby Jaws that we tried. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure Sulu did I Love Your Toes and um, all the songs of the time. But the important thing is, did you make any money while you were out there busking that day? <laughs> None at all. <laughs> yeah. Now, we understand one of your photos is actually in Bermuda's brand new book, Black and White and Weird All Over. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's um, a funny thing about that photo. Bermuda and I were chatting about his book coming up. I was saying, oh, yeah, I've got some pictures from those days, too. And um, <laughs> pictures pictures of Al from before Bermuda joined uh, just are very, very rare because um, nobody was really taking pictures of Al. And I was. Um, but I'm a nature photographer, so you're going to find pictures of Al uh, that I took where he's... Um, you know, surrounded uh, by uh, palm leaves or, uh, uh, you know, one of the, one of the pictures he's, you know, getting dumped in a Creek by Damascus. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, these things are uh, just, I was out there taking pictures of my friends, but I, mostly I'm a nature photographer. So uh, after I got the pictures of Al, then I went back and got pictures of the Creek <laughs> without people. <laughs> But um, what happened with uh, John, though, he didn't want, you know, a, a book of all the pictures of Al or, or vintage pictures of Al. The, the, the theme of his book is, is the pictures he took of Al. Right. And, and so the focus was on, on John entirely. And now Musical Mike has some credits in the book. And um, those are when you see a picture that has Bermuda in it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mike's a photographer, too. And he often had a camera at the shows. And, um, you know, he'll have some good pictures of the old days as well. But um, I think what happened is that John handed Mike the camera and said, here, take a picture of us. So even though it's not really John took the picture, it is John's film. Right. <laughs> and right. he's got the negatives. Yeah. And, and so his whole book is all about the pictures he took, you know, or pictures that were taken on his camera. And... Um, and I was fine with that. But then I said, but wait, um, you got to see this picture. Because I had this picture of John taking a picture of Al. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had his camera with the, right up to Al's nose. And uh, it was just that picture John um, sent to the publishers and everyone agreed it, it had to be in the book. Yeah, He had to make an exception for that one picture. <laughs> Um, just because it's a picture of him taking a picture of Al, which is what the whole book's about. Right. <laughs> it's very meta, so... this photo that you took. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the whole reason it's in there. If it weren't for that, uh, you'd be looking for, you know, me to leak a picture here and there on the internet or make a print for someone. Uh, otherwise, my picture's haven't really been in wide circulation. So this is the first time that people are seeing this photo of Bermuda taking a picture of Al. Right. And I, I say that, except uh, it's it's entirely possible people have seen it. The picture was taken on a pretty famous day. It was a reunion show. Uh, everybody who has ever been involved in, in the Dr. Demento show came to that particular show. So it's the one where you see a picture of Everyone, Jungle Judy, Captain Chaos, Dr. Demento, uh, Sulu, and everybody else is in that picture. Um, and this is uh, another picture from that day. Oh, cool. Yeah. And do you know about when that was? As a matter of fact, I, I suggested it was about this day, and, and John confirmed it's uh, October 20th, 1985. Oh, wow. Very cool. So we will celebrate the anniversary of this photo being taken a few days before or a week before the book Black and White and Weird All Over comes out. <laughs> All right. It sounds good. 
And of course, you can listen to uh, anyone who has membership with drdemento.com can go and get that archived show and listen to it and hear us all. Uh, it's, it's a really spectacular show. Was that the Dr. Demento 15th anniversary show? Sounds right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 70, 85. Yeah, it's getting there. <laughs> I didn't know it had a purpose. I thought we were just all getting together to have fun. <laughs> Yeah, that was funny. Uh, we all piled in the elevator that day. All of us in one elevator. Uh, <laughs> it ground to a halt. It couldn't <laughs> lift the load. It, it, you know, we we were a little bit early for the show, so it um, it did eventually get us up to the, the station floor. <laughs> but there were some nervous moments in there. <laughs> There's no designated survivor moment where you're like, maybe one of us should not be in this elevator just in case. <laughs> he has oh, all in right. it. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got pictures of us all in the elevator. That That's how I kind of remember that occasion. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Bill, you've mentioned uh, really cool things that you have like in your mementos and, and collection. You know, What are some other Weird Al related things that you've held on to over the years? That's a good question. Um, I just have a few backstage passes from different shows that we went to. Um, no, I don't really have that many mementos. I have just a couple copies of uh, Another One Rides the Bus. I got uh, I've got the the Slow Grown album because I bought it for myself. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, not not that much more. We got the layouts, the photos. Okay, you got that amazing note from Al. <laughs> the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but after that, you know, the the things that anybody could have, right? Uh, just little things here and there. Nothing. Nothing really um, rare or unusual no. other than that note and uh, and, the, and the playlist. The playlist is my prized possession. I, I say hanging on to those playlists all these years. That I'm, I'm going to hang on to that thing. <laughs> that's something that makes a collector like Ethan and myself drool over that, you know, knowing that something like that exists out there. <laughs> Drooling just hearing about I know. it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I keep thinking I'll, one day I'll open it up and take pictures of some pages or something. Oh, yeah, that'd be amazing. You've got our info, so if you decide to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, it has been a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. And a thank you also for giving Bermuda the accordion case and, you know, saving <laughs> another one rides the bus. <laughs> well, Dave and Ethan, it's, it's so great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Beefalo Bill Burke. I think we just scratched the surface of Beefalo's career with Dr. Demento. Yeah, we absolutely need to have Beefalo back. There's so much more to cover, and he just has so much awesome information. I just want to sit down and read that whole book he stole from KCPR. Yeah, absolutely. Anything from KCPR history, I'm definitely on board with getting that. And speaking of books, as mentioned in our interview, Beefalo has a photo in the brand new Black and White and Weird All Over book by our good friend John Bermuda Schwartz coming out this October and available for pre-order now right over at blackandwhiteandweird.com or blackandwhiteandweirdallover.com. You know, each week we can bring you this podcast absolutely free thanks to our sponsors like Brito Brito, Angel Valenzuela, and his son David Cash, Jackson Scoggins, and all of our amazing Patreon supporters like our brand new Patreon subscriber Mason, Trevor, and so many more. Patreon helps us pay the bills and ensures that we can continue doing what we love, and that's making what you love. Yes, a fun, family-friendly, entertaining Weird Al podcast for you each and every week. Please join us in thanking all of our supporters over at patreon.com slash 2000 inch for making this podcast possible. And please consider joining our Patreon family for as little as $1 per month. Another way to support the podcast is by purchasing merchandise from the official Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast shop. Head over to shop.2000inch.com for fanny packs, face masks, neckties, no socks, but also so much more. And this just in, our friend Dana sent us a photo of their yellow Gill and Chill pillow, and it just looks awesome. We love it when our listeners send photos of their awesome merch. Yeah, yellow really looks good on that Gill and Chill. Oh, great choice, Dana. 
Thanks again to Beefalo Bill Burke, Spencer, Eric, and all of our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters, and sponsors. And thanks to everyone who follows us at 2000 Inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Do your part and tag fun, weird al, or podcast related posts on social media using hashtag 2000 Inch and hashtag Gil and Chill. And be sure to join our Facebook group by heading on over to group.2000inch.com if you have not already. Find us online at weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com and make sure to share our posts, tell your friends about the podcast, and we love it when you leave us voice messages via our 27-hour-a-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula. You might even hear your message on the air, and don't forget to include your name when you leave a message. You already know where to find us, but do yourselves a favor and head on over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, or the podcast app of your choice and hit that subscribe button. This way you don't miss any episodes. New episodes drop every Wednesday. And if we're not on the podcast app of your choice, let us know and we'll get our intern Frank to add us. All right, Dave, let's celebrate the 40th anniversary of Another One Rides the Bus by singing it together right now. You know I can't do that. My accordion case is still in storage. That was Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast, episode 72 Inch. So my dad lived at about Wilshire and Western downtown, a uh, street called Gramercy Drive. And Al lived in a little brick apartment on Gramercy Place. It's basically a couple blocks apart. And uh, he was north of Wilshire. I was south of Wilshire. And we, we occasionally would get together and do things, um, go to lunch and stuff like that together. Yeah. And um, th- those were good days, but uh, not a lot of specific details to share about those days. So I, I don't even know if it's worth mentioning. <laughs> 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 Except that, you know, there, there was some time there... Um, in about 82 that that we hung out quite a bit yeah you could even edit that out that that part wasn't even that exciting i thought it was a great story (laughs) i just edited it out